Is that what you guys remember? Awesome. So we're going to continue to move forward. So now that we kind of have, uh, we've talked about muscles and what makes them unique. We've talked about kind of the science with them and how um, they kind of work. Uh, we do want to talk about the benefits. Are there benefits to muscular strength and endurance training, like lifting weights? Okay, I'm glad we, yeah, yeah, there are definitely benefits. That's kind of why we're talking about it. So, um, with that being said, let's talk about some of those benefits. Realize some of the benefits are actually the exact same as those for cardiorespiratory endurance, those that helped our muscles and lungs, but some of those things just aren't as great. Where other things that did happen with muscular strength, or sorry, with cardiorespiratory endurance, are greater with muscular strength and endurance training. So, with that being said, um, first of all, we see a reduction in cardiovascular disease. So when you do things like lifting weights, you're actually gonna reduce your risk for heart attacks and strokes. We saw that same thing happen with cardiorespiratory endurance exercise. This is the same thing's true. Exercise in general helps with these things. We also see an improvement in your metabolism. What is metabolism? We've talked about it once before. The way we use energy or how much energy it takes to keep us alive. Typically when we say improved metabolism, we're typically referring to it as um, it's taking more energy to keep you alive every single second, so you burn more calories every single second of the day. When you do muscular strength and endurance activities, you build muscle mass. I remember those myofilaments get bigger. We build muscle mass, and it takes a lot of energy to keep that alive, okay? More than almost any other cell in the body. It, it takes a lot to keep muscle cells alive. So when we build more of those, you improve your metabolism, literally burning more energy every single second of the day, which for me, what that translates in is to I can now eat more food without gaining weight, right? Like that's my idea is I wanna eat as much as possible and just stay where I'm at, right? For some people, they wanna burn more energy to be able to lose weight, I just wanna be able to eat more, right? Do you have a question? Just like, why, why is con or consuming more energy beneficial? Like why is that? So, I mean, you kinda of just said it can eat more, but. So for me, I eat more, right? So we'll, well, as we go through this semester, we're gonna see that, um, that an issue that we have across the globe, but especially in America, is the fact that people tend to carry a little bit too much weight, which tends to be that they put more calories in than what they burn. And so this leads to health problems over time. So we call it an improvement if we're burning a little bit more because it's easier for us to make sure that we're staying at a healthy kind of weight range and body composition um, than it is if we have a lower one. But that's not for everyone. There are some people who definitely don't need to increase their metabolism unless they truly increase their food consumption by a lot because maybe they're too, um, they don't have enough, right? Yep, yeah. no, that's a great question. Um, because if we were in a different scenario, if all of us were kind of like not eating, right? Like we just all like to starve ourselves a lot, um, which some people do, this might not be as beneficial. Um, good question. So we also see an increase in maximal oxygen consumption. So increasing how much muscle we have, we can consume more oxygen, like at a cellular level, but this isn't gonna be to the same extent as we were with cardiorespiratory endurance exercises. Does that make sense? So going for a run is gonna increase that number a whole lot more than lifting weights, but we're definitely gonna see an increase. Uh, you'll see a decrease in your blood pressure. So your heart's gonna become a little bit healthier. We're gonna see an improvement in your cholesterol. What's cholesterol measure of? Not sugar, so cholesterol is a measurement of fat in the blood. Okay, usually we're talking when we say cholesterol, we're looking at kind of how much fat in the blood is in the blood, and when we do muscular strength and endurance activities, we're gonna lower how much fat's in the blood. And this <coughs> leads to um, things like disease, uh, heart attacks and things um, as we go forward. Um, it also helps us to reduce injury, or it helps with injury prevention, helps us to reduce our risk of injuries. A lot of injuries people suffer is because their muscles um, aren't strong enough to hold the, their body in the right position, or they've just gotten tired and can't do it anymore, okay? So we could use an example of a knee. So if we look at a knee, your knee um, is a joint where two bones come together. And that joint wants to stay pretty tight with those two bones pretty close to each other. And so your muscles, like mine right now, are pulling my knee joint together. If those muscles that are pulling my knee joint together start to get tired, Okay, what happens is the knee joint gets a little bit loose and allows it for it to move around a little bit more in directions it's not really supposed to, and then all of a sudden we can get an injury. That's how some injuries are caused by the knee or other joints. Um, it could be that maybe a muscle isn't strong enough to keep my back in the right position when I'm lifting something, and so all of a sudden we hurt our back. Okay? Um, we also improve our body composition. We'll talk more about body composition later this semester, but body composition is simply how much of you is fat versus how much of you is not fat. And so if we build muscle mass, 
we're increasing the not fat portion and so your body composition improves for health purposes we also see an improvement in your quality of life an improvement in your quality of life when you gain muscular strength and muscular endurance your quality of life is improved now this might not be the case necessarily for you right now but this could be something that you could affect you later on in life because if i asked you guys how many of you feel like you don't like how many of you feel like you don't have enough strength to complete most of the tasks in like a given month like if you think about your life in a given month does anyone feel like they don't have enough strength to do that anything in their life probably not you guys are all college students most of you have plenty of strength to do whatever you can think about doing right but what I want you to think about is I want you to think about the oldest person you interact with on a, on a semi-regular basis. So maybe someone like a grandparent, great-grandparent, maybe even just a friend that you know is kind of in their 60s, 70s, 80s. Everyone got that person in mind, right? We want to look at how could strength be maybe affecting their quality of life. And so this could become you if you don't work on muscular strength and endurance now because you lose strength over your lifetime slowly. And if we don't start on it now, it could be really hard for us to stop that later on in life. So... Think about that person, but we're going to put them to the side for a second, and we're going to talk about you guys for a second. So imagine you get paid today, right? Let's imagine you get paid. I know it's, it's like middle of the month, like no one's getting paid, but imagine you get paid today, and it's been a long time since you've bought groceries for your house, right? And so you're going to go to the store today, whatever store you choose. Um, I like Walmart, Kroger. Like, they tend to be a little cheaper for me, but, you know, whatever. Um, so he's shaking his head. He knows, like, I'm not a Whole Foods man. I can't afford that, right? So, um, also, it's just not my cup of tea. I went to a Whole Foods once, and I was like, I'm out. Like, literally, I'm out. Um, so, that being said, you go there, and you don't just get a few groceries. You get, like, that cart full of groceries. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you load it up. Like, it, you're ready to go for, like, another month. You get all that in your car, right? You pull back up into your house, and it's time to get those groceries from the car, into your house okay that's the kind of, i was about to ask how are you getting those in the house or a lot of you like her and you're saying like it's all got to come in one load do you get some of you're saying no okay you, okay so it's like you got time i'm i'm in my life where i'm like uh, i have time i just don't want to use that time for that right so i'm like you know what it's all or nothing i'm getting all the groceries in one load okay so like i'm do what Everything's coming, all right. So I'm loading up my arms, like got them here. I've got them down this arm, got them in my fingers and there's still bags left. So I'm putting them like over my head. I've got some in my mouth, like literally biting them. Okay, I, like I've got a 50 pound dog, 50 pound bag of dog food between my legs, like walking, like kind of like this. Okay, it's, it's all all or nothing. If, if I leave a bag behind, it's gonna sit there and rot. Okay, that's the idea at my house. Does that make sense? Right, I have mastered at my house being op able to open a twisty style doorknob with my foot, right? Like, that's how serious I've gotten about the groceries, right? And, like, you're losing circulation. It's hard to breathe. Like, you're thinking you're going to die. You finally get to the kitchen, you just let them all out, and then you'll deal with it, right? Okay? A lot of people do that. Some people don't, but it's kind of like a game in my house. That's how we might do it or could do it if we chose to. I think all of you could do it that way. Think about that older person now, right? A person you've had in your mind, like your grandparent, your great-grandparent, somebody uh, maybe who's retired. Same thing, they get all those groceries, they have all those in their car, they pull up to their house to unload them. How did they unload them? They might be a little bit differently than how we could unload them. Two bags, two, two bags right? One in each hand, right? Yeah, that's, that's how some do it. Do you realize some older adults don't have enough strength for that? So it might be one bag at a time, right? And even yet, this is the crazy thing, is we see in older adults that some of them don't have enough strength. Like, when you guys pick up a bag, like a grocery bag, like from Walmart or whatever, have you ever, like, looked inside of it and said, uh, I don't, like, have you ever thought, like, maybe there's too much in that bag? Like, maybe I shouldn't, like, move that because I can't? Or are you just afraid the bag's going to rip? Maybe we're usually afraid, like, there's so much in it that's going to rip. An older person might look in that bag, and the bag will hold what's in there, but they're like, I don't think I can do that. And so it's not uncommon to see an older person actually take stuff out of a bag in their car, take that bag up to their house, unload it, and then bring the bag back to get the rest of what was in there. Is that going to affect your quality of life? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we choose to do it that way, awesome. But if I have to do it that way, that's a big thing, right? So quality of life can be affected. Um, if you've ever been to that person's house or the next time you go over to that person's house, Go to their kitchen, okay? Most it tends to be most older people love for you to like eat their food. Like that's just that's just my experience. Like every time I go to someone's like older's house, they're like, oh please go to the kitchen and help yourself. Like we got this, we got this. My grandma loves to spoil me with like all kinds of goodies. It's great. But go in there and like open up their fridge, right? 
Look at where all the heavy items are, like the, the gallons of milk or like the heavy liquids and things that are way more. I guarantee you they're kind of at chest height or counter height, counter height, countertop height, right? They, they are very intentional about where they put things. When it comes to me and my fridge, I just gallon of milk, throw it up top, throw it wherever there's room, right? Also, in my cabinets at my house, well, things are wherever they just fit in like convenience-wise. Like if I don't use it a lot, it's going to go on the top shelf. For someone who's older, look in their cabinets and stuff, and I guarantee you everything that's heavy is going to be kind of at counter hot, counter top height or very close to it because they can't lift it up very much. Does that make sense? And so that's going to affect your quality of life as you go forward. Could you imagine going to the grocery store, and this happens with older adults, and you're looking at the store and you're like, oh, I could really use a gallon of milk. It's on sale. I'm going to get the gallon of milk. We would just get it. An older adult might see that and be like, oh, I'd really love to save the money and get that gallon of milk, but I can't lift it. So I'm going to buy a half gallon, two half gallons instead. This becomes a big issue, right? And so working on muscular strength and endurance now, we can actually stave this off. You can be almost as strong as you are today, or even stronger for some of you. You can be stronger when you hit 70 and 80 than you are today. If we just simply do a little bit of training. Not a whole lot, just a little bit. Do what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't have to do a ton. I mean, we could. We could make you way stronger and keep you way stronger throughout life, right? Some of you throwing arms up. You know, but just a little bit can keep you strong. And if you want to be, you know, the awesome grandpa, you know, that, like, can lift, like, a thousand pounds, well, cool. Maybe we can make that happen, right? But that's there. Um, finally, we know that when you do muscular strength and endurance activities, we improve your self-image. And so your self-image is kind of how you see yourself. Like, how do you see yourself? Do you see it as positive? Do you see it as negative? Kind of think about, like, when you look in a mirror, what do you think about yourself? I wake up every morning, and I'm like, good morning, sexy beast in the mirror, right? And my wife rolls over and says, you're talking to the dog again. Like, every morning. I'm like, come on, right? Like, that's ridiculous. Like, but I have, I have a healthy self-image. Like, I'm fine. Like, I'm, I know there are flaws or whatever, um, but I'm happy with the way I am, right? Some people look in the mirror, and they can only point out those flaws or they don't see themselves that great, right? They're like, eh, I'm not that great. Well, we know, and research has proven, that if you participate in muscular strength and endurance training, you're gonna see yourself in a better light. No matter what, you're gonna see yourself in a better light. I could take all of you today, and we could start lifting weights, and by Friday, we lift it every day, by Friday, I could make all of you stronger in here. Now, we're not talking like a tremendous amounts of strength, but all of you could be a little bit stronger, and I guarantee you if on Friday, um, I showed you that you guys could lift 10, 15 more pounds than what you could lift today, all of you would walk out of here a little bit prouder of yourself. You'd be like, yeah, you look at that, 15 pounds. Eat it, right? Like, it's showing off. Like, you'd feel good and feel better about yourself. And if we, you looked at yourself in a mirror, you'd be like, I'm stronger, even though nothing really changed. Does that make sense? And so these are really good benefits that we see. You guys good here? Right? Makes sense, right? So what do we have to do before we start exercising? That's a very, like, before we ever lift weights for the first time, what should we do? We should warm up, but even before then. Research. Okay, we should do our research. Yep, yep. We're, we're, we're knocking down all the right trees. None of these are incorrect answers. It's just not the one I'm looking for. But before we start doing maybe an exercise program, what should we do? Like before we plan on, well, before we plan all our exercise out, what should we do first? Change the method? No, no. I mean, uh, again, none of these are bad answers. I feel bad telling you no. Like, warming up is great. Like, changing your diet could be good for you, right? All these things. Researching it is great. The answer I was looking for was assess. Yeah, you sure you know I was going to say it. That's what they all say, okay? Oh, all right, so just say it then. Be confident that's in your like, answer. I know. Well, not no, but just like that's not what I'm looking for. So I was like, I'm not going to But someone's got to have it, right? Like, you might as well be confident in the answers. I'm proud of everyone else for being confident in their answer. You, minus five, for not being confident. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's how this works. So, um, assessing, right? Before we start programming, yes, we need to warm up, right? We need to do this thing, but we need to assess ourselves. We need to figure out what can we currently do and then kind of go from there. So when it comes to assessments, we have different assessments for muscular strength and muscular endurance. There are two different assessments because they measure two different things. When it comes to muscular strength, we're trying to see how much can your muscles actually move? How much can your muscles actually move? And so the test that we typically use for muscular strength is what we call one repetition max. How much can you actually lift one time and one time only? That's what the idea between a, about a one repetition max is. So the way a one repetition max would work is we'll use an example of what's called a squat, okay? And a squat is simply um, the same motion as sitting down in a chair and standing up. 
okay? And so the way a one repetition max would look is we wanna see how much could you physically stand up out of a chair with while it's on your back, is the idea. And so what would happen is, is I would, I, I can all, like we can all stand up out of a chair, okay, right? We can all stand up out of a chair. Um, so what we would do is we'd add some weight to my back. So in this particular classroom, all we have is people for weight. So we're gonna have like, you get on my back, right? And so I'm gonna see if I can stand up and like, cool, I stood up easy, awesome. I'm gonna sit back down. I'm gonna take a little bit of a rest break, a couple minutes or so, and then we're gonna have a second person get on my back, right? So now we've got two people and we're gonna stand up and try it again. Cool, got that one easy, right? And so we're gonna repeat this process of trying it. And if I get it successfully one time, we're gonna rest and then we're gonna add some more weight. And we're gonna do it again, add some more weight. And as we go, what we're gonna notice is it starts getting more and more difficult, like I'm struggling. Cool, we're starting to get close and we're gonna sit down and take a break, right? And eventually what's gonna happen is we're gonna to get to a point where we add a little bit more weight and I'm gonna to go to try to stand up out of the chair and be like, ah, right, like I'm struggling, I get to here and I just can't do it and I'll fall back down. Well, cool. We have just determined my one repetition max. Whatever I got before that was my one repetition max. I didn't complete that one successfully, so I can't do it. The one before that was the maximum amount I could lift one time and one time only. If I could lift it more than one time, it's not enough. If I can't lift it all, it's too much. So we're trying to find how much can you lift one time and one time only. What's that maximum amount of weight? Does that make sense, right? So that's a one repetition max as it comes to a squat. If I did that test right now, if we actually figured out how much weight I could move, right? How much could I literally stand up out of a chair with? Well, cool, that tells me the muscular strength of, does that tell me the muscular strength of my whole body? No, what does it tell me the muscular strength of? My legs, really, really, it tells me about the front of my legs called my quadricep and my butt, my glutes. It can kind of tell me how strong those two things are. It doesn't tell me the strength of any other muscle in my body, right? So, how many muscles do you guys have in your body? A lot, that's a good answer, right? It's like the over 250. You guys have over 250 in your body. And so what that means, though, is with muscular strength, to really get a picture of muscular strength of my entire body, I've got to test every single muscle. I gotta have a different test for every single muscle, right? Because that one just tested like kind of my quadriceps and maybe a little bit of my butt, right? Is it practical to test 256 different muscles? No. No, we can narrow it down. There are some exercises that tell us kind of a general picture of a few di different things, but there's probably somewhere around six to 10 different exercises you would need to do to get a picture of your sh the strength of your whole body. Does that make sense? So with this particular system, it's not a one test fits all. It's a, we've got to test multiple locations to figure out your strength across your, most of your body. You guys following so far, right? So we've got this one repetition max, uh, maximum. Um, the test I just described, do you think everyone should or could do that test? Do what? Not everyone. Who, who might not need to do this or who wouldn't this test be good for? People that don't exercise, good. So people who don't exercise are, are unfamiliar with it. It's probably not a good thing, right? Because if I don't know how to stand up properly, could I get injured? Yeah, I could do it wrong. So people who don't know what they're doing, this test is very dangerous, not a good idea, right? It's a lot of weight involved and a lot of technique. Who else might this not be appropriate for? Do what? Older people, we can actually have older people do this if we can make sure they're doing it correctly. Maybe they've lifted weights for a while. We could even teach an older person to be able to do this. So that's not the issue. The other person might be someone with some type of medical issue. So think about if I put a lot of weight on my back, right? What if I had a spinal issue? Could that be a bad thing to do? Yeah, I've got a friend with uh, scoliosis. Literally has metal rods in their back. Bad idea because we're just going to bend those metal rods and send her into the hospital, right? So there, this test isn't always right for everyone. It's our best assessment, but not necessarily everyone should do that. Also, it takes a lot of time. So if I wanted to test this whole class, eh, that's probably not a good idea, right? So what do you think is a way that we could do something that still gives us an indication of your muscular strength, but maybe it's more of a field test version of it, something that's easier, cheaper to do that almost anyone could do? How do you think that might be? What would be an example? Oh, that's okay. So we have that, but it's not good for everyone. What would be like a what would be a way that I could look at your muscular strength, but maybe like in a field test way, something that's easier, it's cheaper, almost everyone could do, right? You guys did the one and a half mile walk run, and so that was a field test version of the VO2 max test. What would be like a field test version, a way I could look at your muscular strength, but maybe it's not quite as dangerous or doesn't take quite as much effort? 
push-ups? How would how what, what about push-ups? How many you could do? Well, if I could do if I could do a bunch of them, is that looking at muscular strength or muscular endurance? It's so looking at muscular endurance. So it'd be a way maybe. Do what? No, would that be a plank? Like how long could you hold a plank, or is that more endurance? Okay, so how long I could hold like a plank? That's more muscular endurance. So you guys are trying, you're thinking. So I'll, I'll help you out here. That's not a big deal. So what we're gonna look at is we're actually gonna look at um, we're gonna more look at muscle like movement quality. So how well can you perform something? Okay. So imagine, imagine I'm gonna put this up here so you guys can see. Okay. Deal is if I. If I fall and get hurt, first one to call 911 gets 100. <laughs> Calm down, though. If you call 911 and I don't need it, you get a zero. So 50 50. Also, I have it written in my will if I die, everyone gets zeros in all my classes. Okay. I have that, I have that, That's I have fair. that, right? So it's just a, it's just a, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so it is fair. Um, and the reason for that is, is it encourages you guys to keep me alive, right? Should we like get up and stand behind you? Alright, you're fine. You're fine. So it'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. So let's say we start this out. We're gonna we're gonna do that squat, which I said was simply sitting down and standing up out of a chair, right? If I have enough muscular strength to stand up out of this chair, how would it look? It would look easy, almost effortless, right? Effortless, right? I would just kind of stand straight up. So it would look something, something just like this. Boom. I got enough muscular strength in my legs to stand up and sit down in a chair. Awesome. If I don't have enough muscular strength, how would that start to look? Okay, maybe my legs start to shake, right? I put those knees together. What else? Okay, maybe I start using my arms, right? If there's an armrest, like maybe I'm pushing up on them or I'm pushing down on my legs like this or, or you're getting back like this, right? Um, those could be signs. Or my fa personal favorite, personal favorite to watch is people don't have enough muscular strength is like the momentum way. Like, you know what I'm talking about? Like they're, they're getting in the chair and like one, two three right and they come up those would be indications that well maybe someone doesn't have enough muscular strength but that's not going to be a good indication for anyone here because i don't think anyone's really going to struggle with standing up out of a chair do you in this classroom probably not like it could be in an older population so what we can do is we if we did that well what we can do is we can make the exercise harder we can literally make it harder and so what we do is we remove the chair and do the same activity if I have enough muscular strength to do an actual squat with no chair, what happens is I come down and I am sitting here, right? I've got a straight back for the most part. I'm leaning forward just a little bit to keep balance. If you notice, I can actually wiggle my toes so my weight's back on my heels. I can sit here all day. I don't necessarily want to, but I could, right? It's not the most fun thing. And then when I come up, I can come up nice and straight and even. If I don't have enough muscular strength in my legs to be able to do a squat properly, what we're gonna start seeing is we're gonna start seeing maybe people coming up on their toes because you're adding your calves in now. Or maybe they're really lean forward forward so their, toe, their knees are way past their toes instead of being more in line with it. Maybe I'm bent over a whole lot trying to do things like this. Um, and when I come up, maybe it's not like this even movement, but I start pushing up with my legs and then turn my body, right? Or uh, another thing is if I don't have enough muscular strength, maybe I start to come down like, yeah, I'm gonna squat, right? And then I just do this number right here. Have my legs moved at all? <laughs> No, but people will do that, right? They're, I'm getting lower. Like, it's got to be. So we're showing that there's some weakness in the legs. Does that make sense? And then finally, what we can do is if we did all that successfully and we want to see if we're even a little bit stronger, what we can do is we can do it on one leg. And so I can take and prop one leg up in the back of a chair and simply go down and squat. Again, if I have enough muscular strength, I can wiggle my toes. I stay nice and straight. I come right back up. If I don't, I might be on my toes or shaking or other things like that. Does that make sense? By the way, it takes a decent amount of muscular strength to do it wrong when you're not wanting to as well. And you can see that, you can experience that. So a field test version, make sense? Lab number six is gonna be you doing the exact test I just did, the field test version. What you're gonna do is it's simply an observer. So I would suggest that you get someone to watch you do it. There's a rating system, read the directions. Okay, it's a Word document, read the directions. It's very obvious when you guys don't, okay? Um, I can tell just like this that you haven't read the directions, I'll give you a zero on it. Read the directions, have a partner kind of observe you. It gives you a direction on what each score looks like. And you just say like, you do those activities and you just give yourself a grading system, okay? Zero to five, again, read the directions. Um, and then you answer a couple questions. Super simple. Easy enough, right? 
Not too bad. That would be due this Sunday. B2L says it's going to be two weeks from now, but you guys got it. I'm going to go ahead and assign it for this Sunday. Okay? Got a week to do it. It won't take very long. So we've got our muscular strength out of the way. We also want to talk about muscular endurance. Muscular endurance assessment is different than muscular strength. Muscular strength was how much can I do one time and one time only, where muscular endurance is how many times can I do the same movement over and over and over and over and over again until my muscles just give out. Does that make sense? And so what we do for this test is we do what's called a repetition max. A repetition maximum. So how many times can I literally lift the same weight over again? So before what we did is we kept adding people to my back and seeing could I get it one time, one time only with this squat or sitting down and standing up out of a chair. This particular time what we would do is I would just have maybe one person get on my back and I'm gonna sit here and stand up and sit down in the chair and stand up and sit down in the chair and stand up and sit down in the chair without stopping. That's the key, is when we stop our muscles recover, but we're gonna keep going as much as we can until literally I go to stand up and I'm like, uh, I can't, boom. Now we can see how many times did I get that, right? If I got it 20 times, that's some muscular endurance, but if I got it 25, that's a little bit more, right? And so we can retest for that same weight over and over again. That's the best way is to do it with a standardized weight. Like there's a standardized weight kind of for those um, or um, things like that. But is that gonna be necessarily be the perfect test for everyone? Are there people that maybe shouldn't do that particular style of test? Yeah, it's the same answer as before. Maybe they have an injury. Maybe they're not used to the movement. And so there are field tests for muscular endurance or field tests that can do the exact same thing. What's an example of a, maybe a field test of muscular endurance that could assess muscular endurance but maybe not have um, as much of the risk and have to push ourselves quite as hard. You guys are probably a little bit more familiar with these. Push-ups. Have you guys ever done a push-up test where maybe it's how many push-ups you can get in a minute or how many push-ups you can get until you can't? That's an example of this field test, right? Another example of that might be crunches, right? Or sit-ups. How many sit-ups could we get in a minute or how many could we get before we give out? Both of those would be examples of field tests when it comes to muscular endurance. With this, remember, one exercise tells us about only one or two muscles. So we do have to do multiple muscular endurance tests to get a good picture of our muscular endurance across the bot our entire body, just like muscular strength. Does that make sense? So earlier when you said push-up test, if we looked at a push-up and looked for the quality of push-ups, like how well you did push-ups, that could then turn into a muscular strength assessment. Does that make sense? Instead of how many, if we look at how well can you do one or two, that would be a good measure. We good here? Make sense? So lab number seven is you're going to do some muscular endurance testing. Yay! You get two labs right back to back. So in that lab, you have one of two options. Okay, the first, top, the first half of the lab, the first page or so of the lab, um, maybe two pages, you can do the true repetition maximum where you go to a gym with weights or you have weights at your house and you put an amount on a bar and you see how many times you can get it or you get a certain weight so many, like basically you figure out how many reps how much weight you can lift for 20 reps. Does that make sense? That's the one way to do it. However, I know that most of you, um, not most of you, some of you might not be familiar with lifting weights and some of you might not have access to weights. Well, that's okay because the second half of the sheet is doing some field test version. So a push-up test and a sit-up test. I don't care which one you pick, but you need to do one or the other. You can do both if you'd like, but you don't have to. It's just either do the field test or do the actual repetition max exam test and then answer the questions on it. Pretty easy, right? That one will also be Sunday at 11 p.m. So you got, already got lab six and seven that will be due. Good? Awesome. So we've got our assessment portion. We've got that moving along well. So after we assess ourselves, what do we do with those results? So if I figure out how strong I am or I figure out how much muscular endurance I have, what are we going to do with those results? Yeah, so we're gonna take our assessment results and we're gonna use those first of all to set some goals and then we're gonna use those to program, okay? We're gonna use those to set some goals and then we're gonna use those to help build a, pro to program exercise, to build that kind of workout for us. When it comes to muscular strength and endurance activities, when it comes to uh, moving weights, there's a lot of things for us to consider with programming. So we're gonna talk about some of those things and then we're eventually gonna talk about, well, how do we actually build that program? Using that same kind of concept we've used once before in this class but we wanna talk about these things. And so when it comes to lifting weights and, and moving weights, we have different types, okay? 
The first kind of type of um, exercise that we have is static or isometric exercises. Static or isometric exercises. And so this is with um, building muscular strength and endurance. This particular style of movement or this particular style of building muscular strength and endurance is a little bit different than what you guys are familiar with. You've done some of it, but maybe not as much of it as other things. What do you think static means? What does static mean to you, like when you hear that word? Still. Yeah, so static. Typically we think of still, like there's static water, it means it's not moving. So when we think about static muscular strength and endurance exercises, it means that nothing is moving. So no object is moving and your body's not moving. Okay? It is simply muscular contractions are happening, but no movement occurs. Okay? When you do muscular, when you do muscular strength and endurance exercises that are static, where no movement is occurring, it's where you are your actual, absolute strongest. Okay? You are stronger during this static movement than you are any other time. You have more muscular endurance when you are doing it statically than you do any other time. Okay? What do you think would be an example of an exercise that is static, so still, or no movements occurring, but our muscles are still having to work and we're building muscular strength or muscular endurance? What I hear? A plank, right? Where you're sitting there holding yourself there, no movement's occurring, nothing's moving, but your muscles are having to work. That would be an example of static muscular endurance training. Yeah, what? Wall sits, yeah, so if we literally get up against the wall and we're sitting here, right? My muscles are having to work, correct? Yeah, is anything moving? No, so I'm working on muscular endurance in this particular scenario, right? We're seeing how long I can stay there. So we are, we're a little bit familiar with the static muscular endurance. How to work on muscular strength with static exercises? What being, do what? So add some weights. How, give me, like, explain that to me. Ankle weights. So I put on ankle weights, and then I'm just starting to get stronger. Right? So I have to move, right? So movement's in, so that's kind of out. Yes, sir, what do you think? Yeah, you like, like grip strength is usually static. You just like hold something here. Okay, so if we do grip strength, right? So I kind of just see how much I can kind of hold here, right? Especially if I can do it maximally. Like, yeah, we're starting to work on muscular strength a little bit. Yes, sir. If you're doing like a wall sit, you can hold a medicine ball if you're doing it. Okay, so if I, if I go to a wall sit and you just add some weight, a little bit more strength, but still a lot of endurance. It's usually how long we can do it. Our muscles aren't having to go as hard as they possibly can. So we're not familiar with these static muscular strength activities. But an example of it is if I go over to this door slash wall, right? And let's say my goal is that I'm going to try to push this door open. Now remember, it's a full door, right? So I'm trying to push this door open. If I push on this door as hard as I possibly can, right? Is anything moving? No. Are my muscles working as hard as they possibly can trying to push this wall down? Yeah, yeah they are. So all of a sudden, I'm now working on muscular strength but nothing's moving, it's static. I'm stronger right now than I can ever be doing anything else. I cannot be any stronger than what I'm doing currently right now, but nothing's happening. Does that make sense? If I pull on the door, well then, <laughs> same rules applies earlier. If I'm pulling on the door, right, is anything moving? No, but the muscles that are pulling are pull not quite as hard as they possibly can because I'm afraid the door's gonna give, but you guys have an idea of what I'm talking about, right? So these are those. And so the way they would typically work, especially with the muscular strength side, is you're going to do it as hard as you possibly can for six seconds. So I'm literally going to push on this door for six seconds as hard as I possibly can. And I can feel it in my muscles. I'm going to sit there for six full seconds, and then I'm going to relax. And if I do that two to ten times, I'm actually going to build strength. I'm going to get stronger. I'm actually going to build strength quicker than if I actually moved weights. I'm going to get stronger, and I am my strongest right at that particular moment in time. Does that make sense? Right? When you go to the gym, you don't see a lot of people doing that, right? If you were to go to a professional like athlete, like see a, a group of professional athletes and go to the gym with them, would any of them be sitting there doing static strength exercises? Like when you, if you went to an NFL team and walked into their weight room, what are you probably going to see most of them doing? You're going to see them lifting weights, doing things with movements, right? Why is that? If we know that you're gonna build more strength doing that, pushing up against the wall, and we know that you're stronger pushing up against the wall, why do professional athletes move weights instead of pushing up against the wall? Overload. Do what? Overload, I guess. What do you mean with the overload? Like, I don't know, it's like overload, like you can put more weight there. 
to like yeah I guess like give it more resistance or okay so I see where you're at I see where you're thinking right we're all thinking if I try to if I try to get basically if I stand up on on the okay hold on let's use this again right so let's say I'm gonna try to pick up this building mm -hmm. right I'm gonna literally get here I'm gonna try to pick up this building right can I add any more weight to this building and it make a difference no, so the low thing isn't necessarily the issue, right? Because this building's super heavy and I just can't move it, right? I'm not strong as there. But why, you're thinking, right? You're, you're getting there. Why do we not see professional athletes? Why do most people not do these static exercises? Why don't you walk into an NFL weight room and just it's a giant set of walls that people are pushing up against? You see them moving weights. Why? Boring. It's boring. It is a little bit boring and that's a little bit to do with it, a little bit. You don't have like the benefits of moving. Like, okay. Yeah, yeah. So we're starting to miss some of the benefits from movement, right? I am stronger pushing up against the wall. But think about this. When you are playing a game of football, moving. does movement happen? Yeah. yeah. Could you imagine like an NFL game, like the ball's hiked and you just see this? <laughs> like, them just, like them just pushing up against each other. No, no one would watch that, right? In your everyday life, do you have any time at all where you need to like push on a wall till it comes down? Maybe occasionally, right? But but not really, right? You you don't ever like walk up to a classroom that with the door lock. You guys don't sit there and go, Does that mean in like you're pulling up against the door? You guys are like, Yeah, class canceled. Right? Like you don't you try to make no noise so I don't come and open it, right? Like so what happens is is yes, we're stronger here, but at the end of the day, it doesn't translate into everyday movement. It doesn't actually it's not providing us with this functional uh, strength. Does that make sense? Something we actually utilize. But you can do it and get healthier from it. Doing these exercises can make you healthier if we don't need to worry about doing sports. And most people could be fine with that, just getting healthier from it. Does that make sense? You guys following so far, right? So it is there. You do see the health benefits from it and realize most of these static exercises can be done for free because really all you need is a floor and maybe a wall, okay? All of you, it's becoming spring, maybe-ish, right? Like it's becoming spring. And so you got to get ready for spring break, right? You're going to go to the beach, and it's going to be summer, and you're going to go to the beach. And I don't know about you guys, but I want my nice beach butt, right? Like, I want the nice tone butt for the beach. Well, realize you can get your beach butt while sitting in class every single day. All semester long, I've already been working on making my butt more tone and stronger, getting ready for my swimsuit, right? And we can do this through static isometric exercises, literally. You can do them every single time. So all you have to do is, is activate your glutes, so your butt muscles. You just have to contract your glutes. You can't tell that I'm doing it, but I'm doing it right now. So maybe some of you are like, well, how do you do this? How do you do this, J-Ho? Well, all you have to do is, you know when you're like pooping, right? Like, I know, it always starts there, right? You know when you're pooping, right? And then someone hollers at you like, hey, we got to go, like, pinch it off. Come on, you know what I'm talking about? Like, when you're pinching off a poop, like, and you're squeezing those butt muscles together, well, cool, all of a sudden, if I do that as hard as I can while I'm standing here talking to you guys, six seconds on, sweet, relax. Six seconds on, right? And I keep talking to you guys, boom, I'm building my glutes for beach season. Easy enough, right? You can do it sitting in your desk right now. You can work out your entire body during class today as I'm talking. Just contract your legs as hard as you can, like pushing up against the floor, right? Push back in your seat a little bit with your arms, right? So he's doing it right there. He's just pushing back in his seat. He's working on his legs. All of a sudden, you guys can see the health benefits and get stronger while sitting in class. Benefits, <laughs> right? Now, none of you will look at me the same again as I'm walking across this classroom. So, makes sense, right? We've gotten that portion. So let's talk about dynamic. What do you think dynamic means? Because this is a whole other way to uh, build muscular strength. What does dynamic mean? So changing or we're going to have movement happening. Okay. These are the things that we're more familiar with. These are where weights are actually going to get lifted. So this is also referred to as isotonic. Isotonic. So it means that things are moving. When movement occurs, though, things get a little bit more complicated. When movement occurs, things get a little bit more complicated. And so what we have to start talking about is the difference between concentric and eccentric portions of a movement. Concentric and eccentric portions of a movement. And so the best way for us to kind of look at those is we're going to look at some movement and, and talk about it. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at my bicep, okay? My massive biceps. All of you are jealous. It's okay. You too, if you work this hard, can get arms this big. Don't you dare laugh, okay? So, and yes, I understand that I have very pale skin. It's just... Who it is. I worked 20-something years to get that. So, um, that being said, we're going to use the bicep, okay? The bicep is used to bring things to your face like eating, 
Okay, one of my favorite activities. So think about like drinking, right? Like we, we drink water, that's what's gonna bring it to my mouth is my bicep, okay? The job of a muscle, when a, job, when a muscle is told to contract, what it does is it pulls together and gets shorter. So when I lift up this water bottle and bring it to my face, that's what we call the concentric motion or the concentric phase of the movement where my muscle is actively getting shorter, bring it to my face. Does that make sense? That's a concentric where that muscle is getting shorter. Now let's say I drink this, right? And I'm ready, I'm done with it, I'm ready to put it down. Now when I go to put this down, do we just let gravity take over and just bring it to the table? No, right? We don't, we don't just like let it fall, right? We control it on its way down. Well, when we control it on its way down, when we're controlling the movement as our muscles getting longer, that's called the eccentric phase of the movement. The eccentric phase where the muscle is actively getting longer, but we're controlling it. And the way it works is it doesn't work as our muscles are pulling themselves apart. What happens is, remember those little hands we talked about, right? Those little hands that, that were holding that rope? All they're basically doing is just letting go and then catching it, letting go and then catching it. And so you have this, if you ever get something really heavy and you try to put it down nice and slow, you see this kind of like jerkiness and it's those hands like letting go and grabbing, letting go and grabbing and you get this jerkiness. Does that make sense? That's the eccentric portion of the movement. The reason we talk about that is we want to, when we move weights or when we move anything heavy, we want to control it on the way down when it's lengthening, okay? The reason for this is we see a lot of benefits, almost over 50% of the benefits, the strength you build when lifting weights comes from actually the eccentric portion, putting it down under control. If you ever see someone in a gym like picking something up and they get it to here and they just drop it and then they pick it up and, and get it to here and drop it again, they're losing out on half their workout or more. So it's really important for us to, you, it doesn't have to be the most like, we're gonna take five minutes to lower it down, right? But we wanna do it just nice and controlled where we're having to use our muscles. Does that make sense? There are some things where we might not want to, things over the head, it might be a little better to drop it than it is to try to like catch it and like let it come down on you. But you guys get the picture, right? Another thing when we talk about dynamic movement is we have to talk about the different uh, kinds of resistances, the different types of resistances. When we talk about moving, um, when we talk about muscular strength, endurance, and lifting weights, how do we typically measure the resistance when it comes to lifting weights? How many times do we move? The weight is typically what we say is the resistance. So like how many pounds is it, right? And so if we have something like constant resistance versus variable resistance, well, constant resistance is what we're most familiar with, right? So does this water bottle weigh something? Yeah, let's say it weighs a pound. It doesn't, but let's say it weighs a pound, right? So it weighs a pound here. How much does it weigh now? A pound. How about now? How about now? Is it ever going to change? Not unless I dump something out of it, right? But for the most part, constant resistance means it's always going to be the exact same resistance no matter what I do with it, right? So constant. So these are typical weights. We also have what we call variable resistance. Variable resistance. What do you think happens with variable resistance? Like, uh, say so you're like bench pressing and you put like bands on the sides and changes I guess because they're getting tighter so it changes the weight as you're lifting. Yeah so basically the the resistance how hard it is for us to move is going to change depending on what we're doing with it. So he used an example of basically using resistance bands which is like a giant rubber band right when I stretch that rubber band out does it become harder or easier to move? It becomes harder so if I start trying to pick it up like this and I'm standing on it right and I'm trying to push it up over my head it's going to get harder and harder and harder. What happens is I come back down. Do what? It's easier, right? It gets easier to move and easier to move and easier to move. Does that make sense, right? So the resistance is changing. Another way that can happen is let's say I have a giant chain, right? Let's say there's a giant chain on the floor and I pick it up and I've got some here, right? So it's kind of heavy, but let's say I start, it's still on the floor, but let's say I take a step up into this chair. Did it become heavier? Did I start to feel more of it? Yeah, because more of it's off the ground. Does that make sense? And then if I took another step up, it would get even harder, right? And then as I come back down, it gets easier because more of it hits the floor and I'm not having to hold as much of it. Variable resistance. Making sense? Yeah, good. So um, one of the last couple things we want to talk about, at least grouped together, and I think we've got time, right? It's 10, 16, yeah. Um, is plyometrics and speed loading. Have you guys ever heard of plyometrics and speed loading? Maybe a little bit of one, one or the other. Okay, so um, when we talk about these things, when we talk about plyometrics and speed loading, we're going to start with speed loading. You, this is something you guys have been doing for a while and just maybe not realized it, okay? So when it comes to it, um, let's talk about jumping. 
Let's say I want to jump, right? How do I jump? You guys tell me. What do I do? Like, how do how do I jump? Like, I want to jump up. What do, what am I gonna do? Push off the ground. I'm just gonna push off the ground, right? I'm just gonna push off the ground and go up, right? That's what we're gonna do. So the way that would look if we're gonna jump up is it should look like this. No, no. Some of you are shaking your head no, but that's what you told me to do, right? I want to go up, so I should just simply. And by the way, this is as high as I can possibly get. Notice how high I get off off the ground when I push with everything I have, right? This is how high I can get. How high did I get? Like, like maybe like a half inch, right? And most of you looked at me when I did it and said, no, that's not right, right? Because all I did was go up. What, why did you say, no, that's not right? I got to bend my knees. I got to squat down, but that doesn't make sense. The goal in jumping up is to go up, right? <laughs> what sense does it make to go down before I go up? There's momentum. Well, well, okay, so a lot of you knew as soon as I did it that I did it wrong or that I didn't do it correctly. And every kid from a really young age knows that if I want to jump higher, that I have to bend down and then jump up. Does that make sense? Right? And so what happens is from a very young age, we've learned speed loading. And that is I'm going to go in a counter movement. I'm going to have a counter movement in the opposite direction. So I'm going to go down before I go up because I'm going to get higher. And what happens is we get more of effect. We basically, our um, muscles get stretched out a little bit and we're allowed to jump higher and produce more force to jump higher. Does that make sense? And so the way that looks is if all of a sudden, remember how high I got up last time, if I do speed loading and I do it quickly, what happens I go from being able to jump half an inch to being able to jump here. Big difference, right? Speed loading is what makes that. Also, it has to be quick. You never see anyone going to jump and being like, and then going up, right? Because it loses its effectiveness. Does that make sense? What plyometrics is, plyometrics is using gravity to do the same thing, to kind of load our muscles. So we step on a box, and we, simply, we don't jump off. We step off and we let gravity force our muscles into loading them. And then we're going to jump up. So I literally step off and as soon as I hit the ground, I jump up. And we get a very similar benefit. The idea is that we eventually work up to something higher. And then we can get a better benefit than we ever could with our own muscles. Yes? Um, so like when you teach them to jump in, like the, the step thing, like when they start on the ground and they jump onto a box, is that... So... Not really. So if they're jumping, if I'm jumping up onto this box, right, if I'm jumping up onto that box, um, that is more me just working on my explosiveness, like making those muscles stronger. And then if I take and step off the box on the other side, then I'm doing that kind of system. So you'll see some people doing both, right? Going down and letting that go to the next box. So it could be. Good question. Make sense? Okay. So I know we're out of time.